Since the conquest of England by William the Conqueror in 1066 until the wars of the 19th century, France and its overseas neighbour across the Channel faced off for nearly 800 years. On the European continent, on the seas, or on the other side of the world, any pretext was good enough to reignite the flames of war. One of the major conflicts in this age-old rivalry is none other than the Hundred Years' War, which would profoundly mark the end of the Middle Ages. The causes of this conflict are often reduced to a dynastic dispute between the Capetian family, who rule in France, and the Angevin dynasty of the Plantagenets, who reign in England. However, the origins of the Hundred Years' War are actually numerous and varied. Dynastic, territorial, or economic. Reasons for going to war were abundant in the early 14th century. Let's review the points of friction between the two kingdoms to understand what ignited the spark and caused this war that would last for 116 years. Victis. The Causes of the Hundred Years' War If the Hundred Years' War begins in 1337, the kings of France and England have been in opposition on multiple issues for several centuries. Let's go back a few centuries to get a complete view of the situation. At the end of the 12th century, the King of France ruled over a relatively extensive kingdom, but his royal domain, from which he derived his income, military power, and economic strength, was very limited. Barons like the Duke of Burgundy, the Count of Champagne, but especially the Duke of Aquitaine, were more powerful than him. Let's focus on the case of the Duke of Aquitaine. After the death of the English king Henry Beauclerc in 1135, the last son of William the Conqueror, his daughter Matilda the Empress was designated to succeed him to the English throne. However, this was not to the liking of the clergy and some barons, who organized a revolt to have Stephen of Blois, the nephew of the late king, ascend to the throne. This led to a long civil war that ended in an agreement between the warring parties. Stephen of Blois retained his throne until his death, and thereafter, the descendants of Matilda would ascend to the throne. Matilda's son, Henry Plantagenet, who was the Duke of Normandy, Count of Anjou, Maine, and Touraine, thus became the designated successor to the English throne. At this juncture, Eleanor of Aquitaine, the wife of the King of France, Louis VII, was repudiated in 1152. Several theories divide historians on the cause of the separation of the royal couple, but the main one suggests Eleanor's infidelity during the Second Crusade. She allegedly had relations with her uncle, Raymond of Poitiers, Prince of Antioch. The King of France, humiliated before his court and knights, made the rupture inevitable. The degree of consanguinity, cousins at the 4th and 5th degrees, between the two spouses was highlighted to justify the annulment of the marriage. Less than two months later, she remarried Henry Plantagenet, who was ten years younger and had the same degree of consanguinity. Eleanor brought the Duchy of Aquitaine as her dowry, adding to his already numerous continental possessions. When Henry finally ascends to the throne of England in 1154, he is at the head of a true empire that stretches from the Pyrenees to the Scottish border. Furthermore, Henry takes control of the Duchy of Brittany. In 1166, he forces Duke Conan IV to abdicate in favor of his five-year-old daughter Constance. Power thus entirely passes into the hands of Henry Plantagenet, who betrothed the little girl to his eight-year-old son. Geoffrey and Constance will marry fifteen years later, and Brittany will definitively fall under the influence of the Plantagenet family. We are thus facing a complex situation. The King of France, has a king as his vassal. Indeed, the Duke of Aquitaine was a king, but the king in Aquitaine was the king of France, not the king of England. Therefore, when in England, Henry II is equal to the king of France, but he is his vassal and owes him loyalty and homage when it comes to his continental possessions. To this intricate feudal situation is added the fact that the possessions of the Plantagenet in the Kingdom of France are such that his domain is much richer and more important than that of the King of France. A particular king, 
Philip Augustus, will seek to weaken this cumbersome neighbor and will gradually succeed in nibbling away at his territory. At the end of his reign, the royal domain of the King of France has multiplied by five and includes Normandy, Anjou, and, above all, the Plantagenet possessions on the continent are now limited to the Duchy of Guyenne, a coastal strip about a hundred kilometers wide from Bordeaux to Biarritz. The King of France is finally the most powerful lord in his kingdom. The Duchy of Guyenne will subsequently be used as a lever by the King of France to submit the King of England. Indeed, in case of failure to fulfill vassal obligations, non-compliance with the rendered homage perjury or conspiracy, the King of France could confiscate the Duchy, which despite its reduced size, remained the richest region of the Plantagenet Empire, notably due to its significant wine production. The kings of France will resort to confiscation multiple times in the decades preceding the beginning of the Hundred Years' War, humiliating the King of England each time and temporarily depriving him of the fiscal revenues of his duchy. To this territorial rivalry is added an unprecedented succession crisis for the Kingdom of France. Indeed, since the advent of Hugh Capet, who founded the Capetian dynasty, the king has always had a son to succeed him. Historians then speak of the Capetian miracle. The Capetian monarchy is initially elective, and the principle of the heredity of the crown gradually enters customs so that after Philip Augustus, the kings of France are no longer crowned during their father's lifetime. Now, only the acclamation of the king by the greats of the kingdom during the coronation remains of the elective principle. At the beginning of the 14th century, the King of France is Philip the Fair. He has three sons, Louis the Quarrelsome, Philip the Tall, and Charles the Fair, and a daughter, Isabel. The succession of the Iron King seems assured. The eldest son of the king, named Louis, future Louis X the Quarrelsome, is married to Margaret of Burgundy, and currently has only one daughter, Joan. Then, a royal scandal, which will go down in history as the Affaire de la Tour de Nesle erupts. The three beautiful daughters of the king are caught in the act of adultery. Neglected by their husbands, princesses Margaret of Burgundy and Blanche of Artois, wife of Charles the Fair, had taken two young squires as lovers. The third princess, Jeanne of Artois, the wife of Philip the Tall, was not involved but was aware of the actions of her sister and sister-in-law. On the orders of King Philip the Fair, the two squires would be arrested, swiftly judged and executed while the two adulterous princesses would also be arrested and imprisoned. Margaret of Burgundy would die of cold in her prison at Chateau Gaillard, and Blanche of Artois would serve ten years in prison before ending her life in a convent. Jeanne of Artois, although not directly involved, took some time before fully clearing herself. This is a blow to the Capetian dynastic succession. Louis the Quarrelsome, the future King of France, has neither son nor wife. After the death of his father on November 29, 1314, Louis X ascends the throne of France but dies 18 months later, leaving the new queen, Clemence of Hungary, pregnant. Doubts loom over the succession to the throne of France for the first time in nearly 350 years. If the queen gives birth to a boy, he will be king from birth, and his uncle Philip the Tall will assume the role of regent until his majority. However, nothing is planned if the queen gives birth to a girl. After several months of waiting, the queen finally gives birth in November 1316. And miraculously, it's a boy. The Capetian dynasty is saved. Unfortunately, little John I dies after a few days, much to the dismay of the people who see it as the hand of certain princes who had much to gain from it. Philippe the Tall declares to his uncle Charles of Valois and his brother Charles the Fair that he considers himself the most rightful heir to the kingdom. Joan, who has the disadvantage of still being a child, in addition to being the daughter of an adulterous queen, cannot oppose her uncle Philippe, whose intelligence and bravery in combat are recognized by other barons. Philippe V thus declares himself king with the approval of the kingdom's greats at the end of November and is crowned at the Cathedral of Reims on January 9, 1317. Joan is thus excluded from both the throne of France, the throne of Navarre, and also from the county of Champagne in exchange for an annuity of 15,000 pounds. The principle of masculinity, introduced by Philippe the Fair for the transmission of appanages, was therefore beginning to apply to the Kingdom of France. This was so well accepted that at the death of King Philippe V in 1322, it was Charles IV 
the last son of Philippe the Fair, who ascended the throne of France. No one considered for a moment making one of Philippe V's four daughters the new Queen of France. Like that of his two brothers, the reign of Charles IV was short-lived. Barely six years after his accession to the throne, he died without a male heir, thus concluding the famous episode of the Cursed Kings. As often happens, history likes to repeat itself. At the death of Charles IV on February 1st, 1328, the Queen is seven months pregnant. However, the King had taken precautions this time. If the Queen gave birth to a son, he would be king under the regency of Philippe de Valois, cousin of the deceased King. And if it were a daughter, he entrusted the peers of France and the great barons to choose as king whomever they deemed to have the best right. The French monarchy thus reverts to its elective nature. Already regent pending the birth of the royal child, which turned out to be a girl, Philippe de Valois quickly emerges as the only viable option for the great barons whom he has the esteem of. He is indeed the closest male relative of the deceased king, and has the advantage of being an adult with a reputation for wisdom and courageous knighthood. During discussions, however, some jurists put forward a new name, that of Edward III of England. Not only is he the grandson of Philip the Fair, but he is also his male descendant, while Valois is only his nephew. The name of the King of England is quickly dismissed. Indeed, if women do not have the right to the crown, how could he inherit a right from his mother Isabel that she herself does not possess? As Bishop Jean de Marigny rhetorically puts it, the fleur de lis do not spin. However, one must seek this categorical rejection of the King of England's candidacy elsewhere. The French barons do not want a foreign prince, whether he is the grandson of a king of France or not. It doesn't matter if he comes from a French dynasty and if his native language is French. It must also be added that the barons are not eager for a too powerful king who would limit their maneuvering room which would inevitably happen in the case of the union of the crowns of France and England. Edward III and his few supporters are under no illusions. The barons want a king native to the kingdom. The King of England does not have the means to oppose this decision and must accept it. While it may not be the true cause of the conflict's outbreak from the English perspective, this law of male succession, now the rule for the succession to the crown of France, will serve as justification. Philippe de Valois is thus chosen by the French barons to succeed his cousin. The support of the barons, however, is not without conditions. Indeed, many of them negotiate for land and money, but also intervention in Flanders to quell a new revolt. He is crowned in Reims on May 29, 1328, and takes the name Philip VI. Edward III is absent during the coronation, but after long months of hesitation, he resolves to come to France to pay homage to Philip VI for the Duchy of Guyenne. All the great figures of the kingdom were present to witness the homage. So, they were both honoring Edward III and ensuring that this act, which reminded him of his inferiority, did not lack witnesses. Negotiations continue during the years that follow between the kings of France and England regarding the borders of Guyenne and the restitution of castles confiscated by the King of France. Several times, it seems that war is on the brink, but neither of the two kings truly desires it. There is even hope for a lasting peace to be signed. Indeed, in accordance with the old alliance, France sets as a precondition for peace with England that the latter also makes peace with Scotland, which had embarked on its second war of independence. The country, which had gained its independence once before during the reign of Robert Bruce, had to face English attacks again. The armies of this independent and rebellious Scotland had routed the English forces several times, threatening the security of England. England manages to reverse the trend by defeating the army of David Bruce, who is still a child, in the Battle of Halidon Hill in 1333. A Scottish claimant, favorable to the King of England, is subsequently placed on the throne. After this defeat, David Bruce and his entourage seek refuge in France and are hosted at Chateau Gaillard. Representatives of the King of France and the King of Scotland meet several times to decide on the course of action to regain the advantage in the Scottish conflict. For the King of England, who cannot tolerate interference in what he considers his sphere of influence, things are clear. Philip VI positions himself as an enemy of England. From then on, the enmity between the two cousins will only intensify. On the other hand, the Flemish question also constitutes a significant point of friction between the French and the English. 
This prosperous region of the Kingdom of France had successfully developed a high-quality textile industry recognized throughout Europe. The Flemish bourgeoisie of the major cities, finding the taxation of the count and the king too burdensome, revolted regularly. The French nobility still remembers the Matins of Bruges and the Battle of Courtrai, during which the French knighthood suffered a humiliating defeat against the Flemish infantry. Although the insult had been avenged, and the revolt crushed after the victory at mont en the Flemish bourgeoisie remained resistant to royal authority. The poor harvests of the year 1315, and the increased taxes imposed by the new Count of Flanders, Louis de Nevers, once again pushed the Flemish from certain cities such as Bruges or Ypres to rebellion. With Ghent choosing to align itself with the Count of Flanders, a civil war grips the region. Seeing that he couldn't handle it alone, the Count of Flanders takes advantage of the homage he pays to his overlord, Philip VI, to ask for his assistance. The new King of France, Philip VI, sees this as an opportunity to assert his authority over the barons while strengthening his power. The king takes the Oriflamme at Saint-Denis and heads towards Flanders. Meanwhile, the people of Ghent attack Bruges, immobilizing a large part of the insurgent forces for the defense of the city. Entrenched on the heights of Montcassel, the remaining insurgents await the French army with determination. The insurgents are crushed by the royal army, and Philippe VI, who is on the front lines, proves his worth, consolidating his position on the throne and asserting his legitimacy in the eyes of the barons and the population. This takeover of the county by France worries the English even more, especially since they are the main exporters of wool to Flanders. However, this hub of European trade sees its importance diminish at the beginning of the 14th century due to excessive regulations and a refusal to innovate to keep pace with the techniques of their time. The invention of the compass and the rudder, along with the increase in ship tonnage, allows Italian merchants to trade directly with England without going through Flanders. Workshops now produce their own fabrics, further contributing to the ruin of a portion of the Flemish bourgeoisie. The opening of new, shorter routes through Germany reduces the traffic of merchants passing through France. The fairs of Champagne, Troyes, Provence, Bar-sur-Aube, and Lagny-sur-Marne, one of the economic center of the kingdom, see their traffic decrease by 75% in just a few years. While new trade routes emerge, France is too sclerotic and looks too much to the past to realize and catch up with its neighbors who are already developing a maritime fleet that will sorely be lacking in the centuries to come. A beginning of recession is therefore starting in the realm of Philip VI. The industrial economy is not the only one suffering in the early 14th century. One must also add a signiorial crisis affecting landowners. Peasants must pay a fee for the use of their land to their lord. However, the amount of this tax, set more than 200 years earlier, did not take inflation into account. As a result, land revenues decreased by two-thirds between the 12th and 14th centuries. This decrease in income for the nobles is all the more aggravated by the spoiled harvests of the years 1315-1317. The severe famines that followed led to a decrease in the population and consequently a shortage of labor. This caused an increase in wages and therefore a decrease in income for the lords. As a result, they gradually abandoned their land estates to turn to a much more lucrative activity, war. Everything seems to be falling into place for a conflict to take place. Robert of Artois, one of the great barons of the kingdom, will serve as a catalyst for this conflict. Also involved in a succession dispute, he feels cheated and appeals to the king to resolve this issue. At the death of his grandfather, the county of Artois goes to his aunt Mahout because Robert's father is already dead. Feudal law argues that the lands go to the last living child, and no one thinks of giving this county to a 15-year-old with little influence. For years, he will tirelessly cry foul and demand redress at every opportunity that arises. However, since the advent of Philip VI, things have changed. The primacy of males in succession has come into play. In 1329, at Mahout's death, Robert once again asked the king to settle the matter, so that he can reclaim what he believes is rightfully his. However, he is not the only one with eyes on the county. Other prominent barons are also interested. The case is brought to court in 1330, and when the clerks of the parliament inspect the documents provided by Robert of Artois to support his claims, astonishment. They are forgeries, crude forgeries at that. 
Robert of Artois is immediately dismissed but now faces a much more serious accusation, that of high treason. By producing forged documents, he appropriates a royal prerogative, and the king is thus obliged to take action. The forger Jeanne de Divion goes to the stake on October 6, 1331, and anticipating the banishment sentence that will fall on April 6, 1332, Robert of Artois flees. He travels in the south of France, and then in Belgium before seeking refuge with a man who hates the King of France as much as he does, Edward III of England. Across the Channel, Robert of Artois will not cease to stoke the ambition of the King of England by repeatedly telling him that he is the most direct heir and therefore the most legitimate claimant to the Crown of France. As all the pieces of the chessboard fall into place, Edward III, finding himself in the midst of a veritable nest of vipers, decides to protect his crown by directing his baron's eagerness for conflict toward a new enemy, Philip VI of France. While the real source of discord between the two sovereigns lies in Guyenne, the French support for the Scots and dynastic quarrels are highlighted to justify the start of the conflict. Edward III obtains credits from his parliament to wage war, and, fearing a French invasion of his island, he assembles a fleet to take the war to the continent. On the other hand, Philip VI sees no objection to the war. Indeed, he views it as an opportunity for the kingdom to replenish its treasure chest and a means to definitively establish his legitimacy. To try to isolate the King of France, the King of England, at the end of the year 1336, bans all wool exports to Flanders and all cloth imports from overseas, aiming to sway the drapery towns to the English side. Edward III also grants extensive privileges to all foreign workers who would settle in English cities, further pushing the Flemish towards rebellion against the King of France. The behaviour of the King of England prompts Philip VI to declare him guilty of felony and decide to confiscate the Duchy of Guyenne. In response, Edward III sends the Bishop of Lincoln to Paris, at the end of the year 1337, to throw his gauntlet at the one he will now call Philippe de Valois, who claims to be King of France. Homage is broken, and war is declared. It will last for 116 years. Thank you to all those who support the channel and contribute to its development. See you soon for the next episode.